Hello, welcome to the introduction to proofs video for strong induction. My name is Professor Michael Polyuk. The learning objectives for this video are, by the end of this video, you should be able to state the structure of strong induction, and you should be able to explain the differences between strong and usual or simple induction. The motivation is that strong induction is a special type of induction that is used to prove theorems of the form every natural number has a nice representation, where nice depends on the context. We'll look at two examples today. This is also the final variation of induction that we'll look at. From a technical point of view, induction, strong induction is used when the induction step depends on many previous cases and not necessarily just the one right before it. So in simple induction, we always worked at the case right before us, but in strong induction, we're allowed to jump back many, many steps. Here's the proof strategy for strong induction. If you want to prove a statement of the form for all natural numbers p of n, you can show that p of 1 is true. And then for all k, if you assume p of 1, p of 2, all the way up to p of k, then that implies the next one. So the major question is, how is this different from simple induction? Well, it looks very, very similar. The only difference is right here. So the math answer to this would be that the induction hypothesis is much stronger in strong induction. And in fact, that's where the name strong induction comes from. There's also a CS answer. So the CS answer is that strong induction requires a lot more memory, since you need to remember all of your previous work and not just the work one step before. We're going to see some examples of this that really highlight the difference in terms of memory and what that means. The first example we'll look at is this theorem. Every natural number n greater or equal to 2 can be written as a product of primes. So here are some examples. Take a moment to write 12, 7, and 5 factorial as a product of primes. I'll give you a moment to do that right now. So 12 we can write as 3 times 2 times 2. 7 there's nothing to do, it's already prime, so we can write it as a product of 1 prime. And 5 factorial we can write as 5 times 4 times 3 times 2, but the 4 can be broken down even further, so we get this. Now, we're going to show that every number can be written as a product of primes. Let's take a moment to think about if we were trying to represent 12 as a product of primes, would it depend on the factorization of 11? Well, not really. So the question then becomes, how do we write 12 as a product of primes using the product of primes of something smaller? So we don't go one step down, we do something else. So let's prove this by strong induction. Let p of n be the statement, n can be written as a product of primes. The base case is n equals 2. Well, just like in the 7 case, 2 is already a product of primes, it's the product of 1 prime. Now the induction step. So assume p of 2, p of 3, all the way up to p of n are true for a particular natural number n. Now here we're going to have to break it up into cases. If n plus 1 is prime, how do we write it as a product of primes? Well, there's nothing much to do. It's already the product of 1 prime. So that's it. Now the more interesting case is what do we do if n plus 1 is composite, if it's not prime? So if it's not prime, that means that there are factors a and b that we can write n plus 1 as a times b. And moreover, a and b have to be small, they have to be less than n plus 1, they also have to be greater than 1. That's what it means to be not prime, is that there are, fact, there are sort of non-trivial factors. Now, since a and b are between 1 and n plus 1, that means that they show up somewhere on our list, that p of a and p of b are both true. 
So by P of A, A can be written as a product of primes, and by P of B, B can be written as a product of primes. So now how do we write n plus 1 as a product of primes? Well, you replace A by its product, B by its product, and then together all of them will give you the product you want. So that's it. That's the end of the proof. Now, I think this proof is kind of misleading in how short it is, and it's easy to not understand what's going on. So let's look at a very important way of understanding how proofs work, especially proofs by induction, by working through an example that uses this technique. So this is the idea of reversing a proof to give us a construction. So how does this proof tell us how to write 300 as a product of primes? Well, the first question is, is 300 prime? So that was the induction step. It was broken up into, is your number prime or not? Well, the answer is no. 300 is 3 times 100. OK. So now the recursive step tells us to ask the same question about both of the factors. These are the a and b. Are 3 prime and is 100 prime? Well, the answer for 3 is yes. It is prime. So we stop breaking it down. But for 100, the answer is no. It has its own a and b, 4 and 25. So now we apply the recursive step on that again. Well, 4 isn't prime, it's 2 times 2, and 25 is 5 times 5. And then when we ask the recursive question again, well, everything will be prime. The 2s, the 5s, uh, and the 3. So this tells us that when we're breaking down 300 recursively, we write it as 3 times 100, then we don't do anything to 3, we break down 100 into 4 times 25, and then we break down each of these into their constituent factors. The square brackets here aren't really important, other than to just indicate where the splitting is happening. So this is what's happening with our recursive proof. Now one thing to point out is that when we were trying to show that P300 was true, or to find the decomposition of 300, we needed to use P of 3 and P of 100, not P of 299. So in simple induction, we would go down one step to 299. But in strong induction, we had to use things that were much earlier and sort of halfway in between. This is one of the hallmarks of using strong induction. Another thing to note is that just because you remember 299 doesn't tell you that you know how to do 300. You need to remember all of the things along the way. This is the idea of using memory. So we have to remember P of 3 and P of 100 when we want to do P300. In simple induction, we only have to remember one step before. One last theorem we'll look at is that every natural number can be represented as a sum of distinct, non-negative integer powers of 2. Now that's quite a bit of a mouth, quite a bit of a mouthful, hilariously. So let's actually look at some examples. 48 can be written as 2 to the 4 plus 2 to the 5. So each power is different, and the exponents are non-negative, and they're integers. So this would be a binary representation of 48. 7 we can write as 2 to the 0 plus 2 to the 1 plus 2 to the 2. Again, all of the exponents are different, and they're all non-negative. So they're 0 or larger, and they're integer powers. So this theorem is saying that every natural number can be represented in this way. We'll see the proof in a following video. You can also read it in the textbook. Let's take a moment to reflect. What are the differences between simple induction and strong induction? Were our proofs about the Fibonacci numbers really strong induction? How much memory did they use? Why do you think that the binary representation theorem is a good candidate to prove using strong induction? What things indicate that to you? Thank you very much, and have a great day.